Pat Sully, archaeological clues long buried have surfaced. A story more than 250 years old unfolds. It is a life story of an African-American slave community. Today we will guide you on a walk down a forgotten road to discover the lost history of Sully's slave quarter. Sam, a blacksmith. Harry, a carpenter. Old Eve and Davy. Henny, Isaac, Ludwell, Juba, Hattie are just some of the names of those long forgotten. These and millions of other enslaved people provided labor, the means for many of our young nation's privileged class to prosper, accumulate great wealth, and achieve success. I'm Robert Watson, site manager at Carter's Grove Slave Quarter in Williamsburg, Virginia. The staff here at Sully in Chantilly, Virginia, and the Fairfax County Park Authority spent time with our staff and shared many ideas. I will help tell more of the Sully story and its importance. I hope this will shed light on this difficult chapter of American history. This story starts in the 18th century. Between 1725, 1746, Henry Lee's 3,311 acre tract of rich land was quartered or established. The land was managed as an absentee holding with an overseer and nine slaves. These African men, women, and children were the foundation of Sully's slave community. They worked the fields planted in tobacco. Large barrels of tobacco called hogsheads were rolled down Ox Road to the Potomac River for export to the English market. In 1747, this land and property, including the slaves, descended to Henry Lee's son, Henry Lee II. Forty years later, when Henry Lee II died, his son, Richard Bland Lee, inherited 1,500 acres and 29 enslaved African Americans. He sold a portion of the land and developed over 700 acres as a farm. This was a family tied tightly to Virginia. Richard Bland Lee was uncle to Robert E. Lee of Civil War fame and brother to Light Horse Harry Lee, a general during the Revolutionary War. Richard started living on the inherited property in 1781 in a modest log house, the first of the Lees to actually settle on the land along Cain's Branch. Eventually, tobacco production was abandoned and replaced by more successful endeavors. Fine orchards produced pears, apples, plums, peaches, and cherries. A two-acre kitchen garden included such items as asparagus and corn salad. Four to five hundred acres were left in timber for fuel and building materials. Livestock such as chickens, turkeys, pigs, and dairy cows thrived in the fields. Grains including clover, bearded wheat, barley, rye, Timothy grass and corn diversified the agricultural operations and all was tended by enslaved men, women, and children. From this forced labor, Richard Bland Lee established a thriving farm that he called Sully. Richard Bland Lee was a contemporary and friend to George Washington and James Madison. He entered politics and became Northern Virginia's first representative to Congress, serving three terms. In 1794, he married Elizabeth Collins, the daughter of a wealthy Quaker merchant from Philadelphia, and a lifelong friend to Dolly Payne Madison. The Lees prospered at Sully from 1794 through 1811. Elizabeth bore nine children with four surviving to adulthood. Life in the main house was at times isolated and lonely, but rich in the fineries of the 18th century. In stark contrast was life at the quarter. From 1999 to 2000, a log structure was built to represent the dwelling that stood here in the 18th century. This structure is the middle building of three domestic dwellings found next to the historic road. It is constructed on top of the archaeological footprint of the original house. But the real foundation for this representational slave quarter was the complex 
and lengthy research and planning process conducted by the Fairfax County Park Authority. Archaeology produced the evidence and proof of life at the quarter. Archaeology, the scientific study of material remains from the past human activities, was critical to broadening the understanding of the slave presence at Sully. Enslaved people left few, if any, written records, and plantation owners rarely, if at all, wrote about slave culture. The archaeological studies at Sully began with a walking survey. Richard Bland Lee owned slaves, so it is certain that the farm included housing for this labor force. After examining models showing the likely structural arrangements for middle-sized plantations such as Sully, the Park Authority's archaeologists walked the fields and lanes periodically digging test pits in promising spots. They didn't expect to find remnants of the dwelling structures. Typically, slave huts were poorly built and quickly deteriorated after abandonment. But when they unearthed three distinct artifact deposits typical of slave material culture, just 25 to 30 feet apart, they discovered the probable location where the old slave quarters once stood. In the 1980s, we decided to take a look at the South Road and the rest of Sully because it, frankly, hadn't been done before. And one of the things we did find are artifacts scattered about in an area that we now know of and call the South Road. We found that these artifacts were of certain groups of artifacts associated with domestic structures, and that brought us uh, that gave us the idea that there might be some structures of where people were living in them at one time along the South Road. And if that was true, then those structures were likely something for the tenants or for slaves. We can apply certain techniques in archaeology to figure out where the placement of a window or a door might be, mostly on the distribution of artifacts. And what fa we found was that window glass was distributed throughout the site in a very special way. And it was collected, or it was found in abundance, in two specific places. And we hypothesized that it was in those areas because the windows had been there and the glass had broken out from them. The glass that we found was certainly not of a period when the slaves were there. They probably didn't have glass. This came later when the buildings were refurbished into farm buildings during the Haight ownership sully. Having it being built over the swale certainly helped in the construction, it simplified it in fact, by using the existing bedrock that was already very close to the surface. And in some cases we can see where the bedrock was actually chiseled away from the sides in order to make a nice pier or foundation. The main type of artifact was associated with a domestic structure, and, and that included things that you would find in the kitchen, like plates and cups and bowls. There were uh, ar uh, architectural artifacts, which indicated the construction of the building. There were also some personal items, which you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in abundance, and indeed we didn't see in abundance. And then personal items are everything from smoking pipes to uh, buttons to coins. We found three coins at the, at the South Road. This penny is from 1806. The slaves were able to rent out their time after the working for the, for the master. And that was another prevalent occurrence, especially here in Northern Virginia during uh, the period of slavery. What we did find is that the three structures along the South Road were fairly close together, and that's typical, again, of a slave quarter. They're often grouped uh, quite close together because they share things. They share wells. They share the uh, closeness to the farm buildings so they can get up and get their equipment and get out to the fields with little waste of time. They share fires. Uh, they share privies. They share many, many things. They share uh, food items. 
and they share space in, with inside the structures themselves. The question is often asked how many people could possibly live in these structures and from a lot of research we've done we figure that approximately anywhere from 8 to 10 people could be living in any one of these structures. So if you m multiply the highest number you could have upwards of 30 people within very close proximity to one another living along the south road in these three structures. Bricks were used in the construction uh, of the slave dwellings, particularly in the piers and in the fireplace. This is a handmade brick. A bit, it's just a, what we call a bat or part of a brick. This was a, a mug. We know that these things were passed down, these items were passed down by the planter to the slave, so there's a time lag involved. And this showed up at the site sometime in the 1790s. And these are sherds that were put together to, to form uh, the little, a little bit of the shape of a bowl. And this was a utilitarian bowl. We call this redware for pretty obvious reasons, but um, it was uh, the main type of, ma of material of uh, ceramics found at the site. And that's something to be expected. One wouldn't find very exclusive or highly expensive materials at a slave quarters. The next one, though, it is interesting in that it, it, it is a, a an ex somewhat expensive item. It's a Chinese uh, import ware, and this was likely very likely that this was a pass, a hand-me-down from the very table of Richard Bland Lee to the slave quarters, and it's probably his plate at one time, his family's plate. And as you can see, this is the very basic, very popular Canton ware design. Of course, we did find bones. These are two are bird bones. We can tell because they're so lightweight. And this one we we feel is a, a piglet because of the type of incisor that is here and the size of the mandible, which is the lower part of the jaw. We found bird bones, we found squirrel, we found deer, and we found domesticated animals like cow and pig. But finding the deer and finding the squirrel bones, that gives an indication that the slaves were allowed to hunt for themselves. Hunting for themselves may mean that they needed to supplement their diet. It also meant that anything that they did had to be done on their own time, which was certainly very limited considered, considering the hours in which they had to work. In 1984, we had from the Sully Foundation um, a grant and the beginnings of an archaeological survey out here at what they felt would possibly be the South Road site. They, they worked here in 1984 and also in 1985, and that's when they found the, what we feel were the remains of, the, of some of the quarter. We are very blessed in the Lee documents because there is so much reference in the letters, uh, particularly from Elizabeth Collins, when she talks about the various um, enslaved people, and we have the names. We have the names of individuals and of families. We had little uh, snippets in letters of uh, Mr. Lee and I uh, rode out to and suggesting that the slave structures were certainly not with an easy walking distance but were further away because they rode to these structures. So we, we actually started in concept again trying to think where would be probable locations for slave structures. Dulles Airport is obviously right next to us and much of the property of, that the Lee's own is underneath runways and associated with Dulles Airport but yet there were some areas that were relatively undisturbed and they were very exciting targets for us to look at. But each time we would look, nothing came of it. We could not find any evidence. There are references to people that were here after the lease, like the Hates, and, and they talked about um, playing as children in, in old cabins that may have been slave quarter that were out uh, farther to the northeast of the site. Very typically they would cluster agricultural and slave structures 
along these road, entrance roads, if you want to call it an entrance road. So that would help us focus into this particular location. The road was actually found in 1985. The first year they found evidence of at least three structures. And then and when they came back, they being the contractors, um, again funded by the Sully Foundation in 1985, they, they located the 18th century roadbed, which was very exciting. Um, the research that we continued on through all these years, again, involved uh, not only using our primary source materials, the Lee, the Lee family documents, but um, documents from other families in Northern Virginia. Colonial Williamsburg at this point was coming up with Carter's Grove. They were very, very supportive in sharing the information, everything that they had, although they were dealing with an earlier period. But it still provided some, some information. We went down to Carter's Grove several times to uh, meet with their staff and spent time with Robert Watson um, discussing how it was that they built the village down there. This was a reconstructed village based on archaeology from the 18th century. Um, they had several buildings and we really wanted to base the type of construction on what we saw at Carter's Grove. So some of the techniques that were used at Carter's Grove we used here at Sully. We also invited uh, speakers in to help with our training of our docents and our paid staff. We had Dr. Rex Ellis from the Smithsonian Institution in Colonial Williamsburg come in. Uh, John Michael Latch came in who wrote Back of the Big House. Dr. James Horton who wrote Hard Road to Freedom and they all talked on various subjects to do with 18th and 19th century slavery. We took our Slave Life Learning Center and we, um, on, in February when you have Black History Month, we would present it on the weekends. We had um, African American quilts at our quilt show. We went out into the schools and talked about it. Um, we held symposia with um, scholars and, and colleagues so that they would come and share their information. So we were gathering it all sorts of places and sharing with people as we as we went along. With the museum education program, the students participate in activities that would have been done by the African Americans at Sully. They do activities in the outbuildings that are original up by the main house. They make beaten biscuits with the kitchen program and on the African American tour itself they get to take a butter mold um, over to the dairy. They get to take a bucket of water into the laundry room, learn about Madame Juba, who was the laundress out here at Sully, go into the kitchen and uh, touch a toe toaster, as Thornton might have done, who was the enslaved cook at Sully 200 years ago. They then go into the main house to see how the Lees interacted with the African-American slaves that were here at Sully. The students very much feel that they are stepping into the past over 200 years ago and feel that they are a part of this life in the 18th century, minus the computers and the TVs and the planes and the cars. They get to learn about Tom Salter, who was an enslaved African American here at the colonial time period under Henry Lee I and Henry Lee II. We know that he was accustomed to play the fiddle. And so we know by growing gourds and such, and the importance of music, that we have a gourd banjo here. We have some bones made from cow bones to denote rhythm music that was very important with music in the slave community. You can see the results of the furnishings plan research when you come to Sully and go inside and outside the um, slave quarter structure. Some of the objects that we put into the furnishings were based on our own archaeology. For example, we found pieces of clay pipe, um, a few shards of Chinese export blue and white ware that might have represented a piece that um, possibly could have been given to one of the enslaved individuals by the Lees or perhaps even purchased by one of the um, people who lived here. We also found red ware and other types of ceramics here and we are purchasing reproductions to um, illustrate those kinds of archaeological findings as well as glassware. We did find the bottom of a green glass wine bottle and we have purchased a reproduction to illustrate that. We know that enslaved individuals at Sully were given musk melon seeds to plant in their gardens. We looked at other um, research on things that were typically grown by enslaved African Americans in their own little gardens 
One of them very commonly was gourds, and so we have several objects made from gourds that they would have grown and then fashioned for various types of use. We know that there was a carpenter at Sully and someone could have made simple furniture like the stool that you see and the, the bed that we show inside. Basketry was a very common skill um, and although we have no specific documentation for that, it was the type of container used all over the Virginia plantations in this period. We also were very fortunate in taking advantage on a lot of um, research done by other scholars on Virginia slave clothing from this time period, and we had reproduction clothing made to approximate the number of individuals we think were here, which is based on our own site documentation. One of the most gratifying things, um, I think personally, as well as one of the most challenging things, is that as a supplement to the furnishings plan for the quarter research, we started looking at records that we had of the actual enslaved individuals who lived here and found a great deal of information. And we were able to put um, as much as we possibly could in chronological order and then start to see some of the patterns of some of the individuals who actually lived here and find out a little bit of information about them so that when our interpreters talk to the public, they can begin to see real people. And taking the, if you notice the corners of the building in how the actual uh, log connections or uh, mortising is done at those corners, um, there was no physical evidence here at the site of that detail because they were logs and obviously anything that's organic and would, would have long disappeared or either by fire or salvage or simply by rotting. So why did we choose that particular connection style? Because there's many different ways of making that same connection. Well, the example is sitting at the kitchen laundry. The kitchen laundry has the particular style of the connection at the corner for its logs. And it is with almost great assurity that how that building was put together, since these are contemporaries, and that doesn't mean they were built the same day or the same years, but they existed as contemporaries, that probably the same techniques were used, and thus we show the, that corner connection here in that fashion. Mostly the research that we did was in terms of the joinery, how cabins were constructed during the time period, the different types of cabins. Some cabins were influenced by Scandinavian effects, some by Scotch-Irish and others by French. The cabins in this area are more along the Scotch-Irish, Scandinavian type than the French type. The research that we did on a cabin was applied in terms of the types of tools we used, the joinery used, the materials we used, how the materials and the, the corner joinery was done with each other came out of the research. We went down to Curtis Grove and looked at their work and then some local works around here too. The tools we used were actually reproductions because the historical tools that we have that are actually from the time period are collection pieces. So everything we used was reproductions. One of the significant areas of research we did was on the correct type of joinery that was used. For example, each one of these particular cuts sheds water away from the building. Each cut is angled so that when water comes down, it's taken away from the building so it does not go inward and create rot and all sorts of damage and moisture. And this is exactly the way it was done three, four hundred years ago. The type of mortar we used here was, again, based on research, and all it really was was just mud. Again, this was a slave quarter. So every year, this mud would have to be repacked. In between each one of the logs are small stones, and this is referred to as chinking. All right, what this does is hold the mortar in place. The mortar or mud is just packed in around those stones and then smoothed out, and that's how it was left. And again, during the course of a season, it would come out. Every spring, they'd come back in and pack it back in again. Sully has gone out of its way for many years to be historically accurate and interpret accurately as life was in the time period. If for nothing else, out of respect for the people who lived here during the time and did the work here, we wanted it to be right for their sake, if nothing else. Blueprints for the 16 by 20 cabin were completed by Dave Martin, architect for the county planning office. Lumber and supplies were ordered. Work was scheduled and the park authority restoration carpenters 
began construction. White oak was used for the walls of the cabin. All of the logs were hewn with a broad axe and an adze. The chosen architecture was also supported by original documents. Stephen Collins, father of Elizabeth Collins Lee in 1794, wrote a brief description of the slave quarter. All these houses have good chimneys in them and are very different from such as I have seen for the purpose in the lower part of Virginia. And the blacks here are very comfortably accommodated and clothed. Indeed, they wear much more the appearance of humble friends than menial vassals. Richard Bland Lee also noted in 1801 that Sully had every necessary house for laborers with brick or stone chimneys. Virginia slave dwellings were typically insubstantial buildings of log or frame construction, built on a dirt floor or set on wood posts and measuring from 12 by 18 feet to 16 by 20 feet. Surviving examples indicate that a diversity of size, building material, and function existed. Depending on the status of the enslaved person, the wealth and inclination of the owner, and available building materials. For the slave quarter, a new chimney of stone and brick was completed. The intention was to have a functioning fireplace to use for public programs and tours. In order to involve the community and outside groups, public programs and outreach were planned, such as talk with a carpenter, Tours of the archaeological sites and construction site were offered. Building techniques were demonstrated to the public during the 10-month construction phase. rations that were given to the enslaved community by Mr. and Mrs. Lee would have been a pound to three pounds of fat back or salted meat, which we have here, and also a peck of cornmeal. Periodically, they were also given some salted herring, which is sort of like a fish. Now with the cornmeal, what they would do is they would add a little bit of water to it and stir it up and make it into a dough, sort of like you do with today when you make cornbread. I like to say the cornmeal and water that they used back then, they called it corn pone or ash cakes or hoe cakes. It's like our cornbread minus the sugar, the salt, and the taste. With the fat back, if all you're getting is a pound to three pounds a week, you've got to figure out a way to be able to make your meats last a little bit longer. So one of the things that they did was they would cut it up into small bits, into little squares. With the little squares of meat, they could take that and they could put it into a big pot like this or a Dutch oven. And hopefully in their off time, they've gone to their gardens and they're, they've, uh, they have grown some vegetables like we have here. We have some kale. We have some wonderful cabbage, some beets fava beans. Now fava beans are African in origin. They came over from Africa and they're sort of like the peas like we're used to. You would just open this pot up and use the bean in here, maybe scrape a little of the skin off of it. And then you would take all these wonderful vegetables and you could just put them right in the pot. Now they call this one pot cooking or soupy stew cooking. Because if you're working in the fields all day from sun up to sun down, Certainly, you don't have time to come back and do a lot, and if this is the ration that you're getting, you have to be able to do something very quick. Another thing they may have grown in their gardens would have been black-eyed peas. Now, we call them black-eyed peas because they have little black eyes in the middle of them. This is also African in origin, and very Southern. A Southern tradition now today is either on New Year's Eve to um, eat black-eyed peas because it gives you good luck. So this was brought over by the uh, slave traders 
African in origin, and they there again would have taken all the black eyed peas, soaked them overnight, and placed those into the pot too, and let those cook all day. Now what's left over from these wonderful vegetables and the fat back that's been seasoning it is called pot liquor. Pot liquor is a wonderful juice left over from all of the vegetables, all of the, the cabbage and the kale. And with the pot liquor, it's almost like a drink. You can either drink it or you can take your corn pone or your ash cake that you've, that you've made from your cornmeal and just dip it right into that pot liquor. The other thing they would have done, they would have grown what they call gourds. And gourds are wonderful because once you grow them and dry them out, then they become great dishware. So not only did they have to try to supplement their diet with making vegetables and maybe going into the woods and trapping and snaring, but they also, I like to say, had to grow their own dishes. So here we have a wonderful example of a gourd bowl, which they could have put stored black eyed peas, or they may have put some fava beans in there, or they may have even put some water in there, and as we see with the small gourd here, used it as a dipper to drink out of. Do you have any questions? Or uh -huh. Oh, you yeah, wanted to know about that. Oh, yeah. um, one thing that, uh, that they could have planted in the garden were gourds. gourds. And gourds were used for different purposes. Uh, yes, follow the drinking gourd. Yeah. Okay, Bowl bowls were made out of gourds. But that gourd, they're bones. They're bones. Uh, I said bones. They're bones. Some type of bone. Yeah. From where? Oh, they Whatever. could have been a cow. Okay. Yeah. Anybody know how to play the bones? Watch her. Go ahead. Watch this. The slaves are important to, well, I guess everywhere because if you didn't have slaves, you'd have to do all your work by yourself and that'd be, take a lot of time. This history is important because it's not like black history, it's like history for everyone because this shows how the black, the slave people were and how white people lived. It was like, it goes together. It represents the slaves, and there aren't many things now that are still here from 200 years ago, but this is very important, and it will tell people about how slaves lived. I think this history should be important to learn about because it's how the African Americans lived and, how hard, and the hard times that they went through. Some of the other things I learned about today were um, how the slaves lived and how the slaves carried the water like seven and s six and seven year olds were were able to carry that um, heavy of a bucket. I learned how the slaves lived, um, how the owners of the plantation, how they interacted, the relationship between the two. This building is important because as we were walking down the road, you look at this building and this is a building where the slaves lived. And then you look up the hill and it shows you where the owners lived and it just sh it shows you how the two lived and quality of life for the two. We usually don't focus on this part of colonial history. We save that for the Civil War and I think it's a nice continuum for the children to realize that slavery was at the founding of our nation and it's good for them to see uh, farm life and plantation life from the slaves point of view and this is the first program we've done that's allowed us to experience that. They seem to be interested about what life was like 
They want to know how the enslaved community was treated. They want to know what they ate, what kind of clothes they wore, and in general, just what it was like to be a slave. I think not only children, but adults need to understand what life was like in the 18th century. It wasn't just beautiful landscaped gardens and beautiful houses uh, with no labor supporting those, those areas. And for us uh, not to build this and not to interpret it would be a big mistake. So I think it just has to be a part of daily interpretation that most sites do if the information is available. Uh, we are so visually oriented in, in the way we process information. We can talk about a letter, we can talk about a concept, we can talk about a theory, but when you be able to say, here is a place where people lived and worked and be able to touch it, even though it is a, a construction and a representation, it still gives that anchor to the experience. And I think that's the really exciting part about this particular site we're at. I really take a personal interest in Sully Historic Site and the Slave Quarter. One reason is because I'm a sixth generation Virginian, dating back to 1799, and I'm also a fifth generation Fairfax County. But most of all, I'm an African American and I take pride in my history. And it's been so long that historic museums and, and house museums really had not talked about the enslaved community. By me being African American, that's my heritage, that's part of who I am. So it's important to come out here and put names to the slaves. They were real people with real names and real lives, and they were important to this plantation. They allowed Mr. and Mrs. Lee to live in the way that they had grown accustomed to living. Our mission at Sully is to interpret the past, 18th, 19th century families. If we don't interpret the African American presence, the indentured servants, the tenant farmers, we are not giving a complete and accurate piece of the puzzle for visitors as well as ourselves. This history is, is very important to learn, not just for African Americans, but for everyone. They need to know where they, what really went on with the slaves and where they came from. Um, I love to know what went on and where they came from because I am an African American. And, it, and to me, it's, it's a part of my history. It lets me see how strong uh, the generational people where I came from. They're very strong people. And it lets me know how I am a survivor today because that's where I came from. Oh, I like that. Say that louder. Someone who is owned and didn't have freedom. These tours help focus on what is known about the life of the enslaved community of Sully and touch on the overall slave history in Northern Virginia during the time of Richard Bland Lee. These programs and tours give people of all backgrounds and nationalities an opportunity to stop and reflect on slavery as an institution the forgotten part of history that may be uncomfortable to remember, yet was vital to the building and success of a new nation. Ha uh ha! -huh.